Welcome to the house of the Lord as we come together by his invite. He comes to us with his holy word and sacrament, bringing to us a message of the forgiveness of sins, empowerment to be able to serve him heart, body, soul, and mind. I don't see any visitors amongst us, so we'll skip that paragraph. Uh, however, I do need to be able to share with you the following, and that is that it has pleased Almighty God to call home to himself our brother in Christ, Don Winter. Uh, Don passed away. Uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Friday uh, mid-afternoon, and so it is that we'll be lifting up prayers of comfort on behalf of him uh, and his family. Uh, to giving thanksgiving to God for the mercy shown for his family as they mourn his death from the sounds and scenes uh, from this earth. So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, celebrate uh, uh, the last Sunday of the church here, Christ the King Sunday. Our opening hymn, as is indicated, the little triangle means that we rise at that time, as that is a doxology verse, so we'll be rising for the uh, fourth verse of that hymn. May God richly bless us in our worship today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. And we are the people of his pasture. Indeed, our Heavenly Father has called us to be his people. He has led us to green pastures and still waters. Yet there have been times when we have treated our fellow sheep with disdain, when we have wandered away from our Good Shepherd. But our Good Shepherd does not abandon us, and we confess our sins before him and one another. 
Heavenly Father, we confess that we have wandered away from you. We confess that we have acted shamefully toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have sinned in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have failed by in our inactivity. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, O oh Lord, that we might follow you to the green pastures and still waters of everlasting life. Our Heavenly Father has heard your confession and sent his only Son, Jesus, to be our Good Shepherd. Jesus searches for each one of his sheep. He brings back those who have strayed. He binds up the injured. He even lays down his life for the sheep. By Christ's death and resurrection, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are sought by our shepherd. We are forgiven in Christ. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, merciful Father, you have appointed your Son to judge as judge of the living and the dead. Enable us to wait for the day of his return with our eyes fixed on the kingdom prepared by your own from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for today is from Ezekiel chapter 34, starting at verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered. So I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There, sh there they shall lie down in good grazing land, and, in a, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be, their sh will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in, in justice. Therefore... Thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with side and shoulder, and thrust at all the weak with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock, they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. This is the word of the, uh, this is the, word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. 
for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. We rise in honor of the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him he will be gathered in all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you were sick, or you sick in, or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as, long as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seen. We'll join our voices and sing in the hymn of the day as is indicated.
up his people's wealth. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours in Christ Jesus, dear Christian friends. Our text, the epistle lesson, which was shared from the lectern, you may be seated. <clears throat> I was thinking for a brief moment uh, yesterday when penning the sermon that I might sing this verse for you. But then I thought, well, maybe I'd like for you to be able to come back to worship and, uh, you know, and not turn off the television if you're watching in the area of live streaming. But see if you recognize this verse. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of that city. I want a mansion, a harp, and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. How many of you recognize that verse? That's because it actually comes from one of all, which is more of a common hymn amongst us, a familiar verse that anticipates the resurrection from the dead and our eternal home. <laughs> the inspiration to start that sermon, the sermon out that way. Well, yesterday morning we had a memorial service here for the uh, parents of uh, uh, good brother John. And uh, uh, I thought to myself while I was sitting up here and singing that song, I thought, you know, that would make a good introduction for the sermon. See, I can't write a sermon until it is that I have everything in my mind and I'm ready to write. It's a good thing that that came upon me by early afternoon yesterday uh, because otherwise uh, we might not have had a sermon at least given Saturday night. So the fact is, is what a wonderful verse and I really love that and I'm so thankful for a gentleman by the name of Hank who decades ago introduced me to that song and I still uh, can envision him and hear his voice whenever it is that uh, I sing that song. Such confidence that we have in this verse grants encouragement. There is no need, is there, to feel poor, to feel deserted or lonely. We know that we are heaven bound. And that then frees us up for a life as we go forward here in our pilgrimage here on this earth. Now this is the last Sunday of the church year, which also can be called the Sunday of the Fulfillment, which also can be called Christ the King Sunday. Isn't it kind of nice that you can take and have three names for the same Sunday? But that's all right. My dad seemed to have at least three or four names for me, so I guess it shouldn't be all that surprising. You know how that goes, right? When mom and dad get the names, you know. I think it's really quite nice when you get addressed as the name of the dog. But that's just the way that it is. All right. It is on this day that we bring to a close a number of the lessons that have been building up into this crescendo of uh, the last Sunday of the church year, Christ the King Sunday. For you know that over the last several weeks, at least since All Saints Day, our lessons have been focusing upon the end times, upon Judgment Day, and upon our heavenly home. And so it is today this is brought forth uh, and it culminates uh, in this way. But I want you to think about a moment, and that is this. What kind of celebration would there be if there was no resurrection from the dead? What kind of celebration would there be? What would be the effect upon our countenance in our everyday life? And finally, what would be our daily existence? Being guided by our emotional and psychological well-being. It's a pretty tough question. I would suggest to you, dear friends, that if indeed it is that Christ was not raised from the dead, then we're a bunch of fools. And we'll, we'll see that again in just a few short moments. 
You see, dear friends, there were those who were in the Corinthian congregation who were espousing the false teaching that Christ was never raised from the dead. Now, they might have come from the Greek background because in Greek philosophy, the concept of a resurrected body being taken on into the next life is just not possible. Why would you take such a filthy thing with you? And by the way, there might have been also some there who were uh, taught underneath the Sadducean form of Judaism, the Sadducean form of uh, Judaism that assimilated Greek philosophy into the Word of God, and they too did not believe in the physical bodily resurrection. And so it is that Paul addresses this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a beautiful chapter. It is affectionately known as the resurrection chapter and has much instruction concerning it. And so it is that we find, at least in this portion of Scripture, that Paul asserts the truth. And then he goes on to relay the uh, implications of the truth that he asserts. So what is the truth that he asserts? It is this. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So let's take a look at this. Paul writes by the inspiration of the Spirit, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then his uh, then his coming, uh, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. In fact, how much more plainer is it that Saint Paul can do as he addresses this false teaching that Christ was never physically raised from the dead? He says, "In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead." And he goes on to talk about the fact that he is the first fruits. I like that concept, first fruits. You know, once it is that I had served in the rural area for a few years, I began to start understanding the concept of first fruits. That's the testing, if you will. That's the first bringing out of the first of the things that have come up. But it always anticipates the next. I guess it'd be kind of like Frito-Lay potato chips now that I think about it. You can't just eat one, okay? For those of you who are my age, you knew that commercial. For those of you who are not my age, it was completely foreign to you. Bottom line is, is that, you know, the first fruits that is there. Christ has been raised from the dead. As St. Paul would remind us that if indeed Christ was not raised from the dead, he reminds us in this very chapter, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then we are dead in our sins. There is no hope. And he goes on to explain, we're just then a bunch of fools. But our faith depends upon the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is the crux of our faith. Though we profess the theology of the cross, cross crucified, or Christ crucified, apart from the resurrection, the cross is made impotent. It means absolutely nothing. We might just as well and believe that Jim Jones or that David Koresh was the Messiah. Simple as that. Christ is raised. And because it is that he is raised, we can anticipate our resurrection. Because it happened, so also will we be resurrected. And this is made clear in some very nice, concise law and gospel statements here in our text. Where it is that it's made very clear that by a man came death, by another man comes the resurrection from the dead. In Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive. That's pure law and gospel. Pure law and gospel. Because sin came into the world, because Adam decided to rebel against God and disobey his command, death then came. 
But God in his love for the crown of creation would not let it be that way. He announced that even there in the Garden of Eden, that the uh, seed of the woman would come and crush the head of Satan. And indeed, that has had happened. Paul asserts that. He teaches that. But not just that. He has been resurrected. So though the consequence of sin is death, the consequence of believing in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is life. And that's called the resurrection from the dead. What a wonderful blessing. And it isn't it interesting that Paul simply writes about this as a matter of fact. This is the way it is. And as my one son would then say, punt the end. To draw emphasis to it. The second part. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God and the Father by destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Now, I'll tell you what, that's quite a tongue twister, isn't it? Try reading that five times over super fast, okay? Bottom line is, is that there is a lot of meaning here. It could take us two to three hours to unpack all of this. And I know that even though the Packer game is not until 3.30, you probably would want to be able to be preparing for that. And so we'll cut it just a little bit shorter. The delivering of the kingdom to God the Father. This is going to happen. You know, every rule and authority is ultimately defeated, says. See, Christ crushed the head of Satan and defeated Satan at the cross. Though Satan still likes to be able to prowl around, likes to parade around, making it look like he's in charge, like he's the boss. But it's not that way. Jesus was sent upon this earth to restore the crown of creation, to reconcile the crown of creation to the Heavenly Father. And that ultimately meant his death. And because he went willingly to the cross, because his holy, innocent blood paid the price, Christ was raised up. And now all that is left to be done is to finish the game. To finish it all. So that the ultimate enemy, enemy, which is the result of sin coming into the world, that even death will be defeated. Now death has been defeated, because Christ has already been raised. And so as Paul would remind us in Romans 6, he can't die anymore. That's going to be the case for you and me. When we're resurrected, we can't die anymore. And what a wonderful blessing and comfort that that is. The last enemy of death will be destroyed. And that will come through the hand of Jesus. And this was the plan of the Heavenly Father. Jesus said before ascending into the heavens, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. That's what is being referred to when it talks about God the Father subjecting all things under his Son. But when it's all said and done, when it is completed, the Son will come back, will be there, be there with this Heavenly Father, and he will turn all things back so that it will be as it was in the beginning at the time of creation when Adam and Eve were first created. There's a lot of tongue twisting there with all of those words of subjection and so on and so forth. Let me illustrate it to you in this way. When I was working in the grocery store, I was management, uh, uh, being trained for management. My boss said to me, Rick, I'm going to put you in charge of the guys in the back room. I kind of laughed about that because I worked side by side for those, for, with those guys for a few years and I knew just how much respect I would have. But anyhow, to humor me, I was put in charge. 
And so it is that I went and I got the work done, the assignment that needed to be done, and I came back to my boss and I reported to him. Now, never in that period of time of getting that work done was the boss under me. I was always under him. But he gave me a particular responsibility of which I carried out and then came back and reported and placed again under his authority. I don't know if that helps out or not. But in essence, Jesus brings everything back to the way it was prior to sin coming into the world, and the Trinity continues to go forward as is revealed in Scripture. You see, dear friends, our hope is the resurrection from the dead. People ask me, Pastor, do you think that we're in the end times? My answer is really quite simple, yes. The end times began when Christ ascended into the Lord's heaven. When he went back home, that's when it began. And you can tell in the writings of St. Paul in his early letters, he fully anticipated that Christ would come within his lifetime. Well, it's been just a few centuries in between. We always need to understand that we are living in the end times at all times. Jesus himself gave many things for us to watch for so that we are always in a state of preparedness. Because we know not the time nor the day. But again, as St. Paul makes it very clear, that after all things have been completed, after it is that God says enough, then it is that the end will come. Judgment day will be there. We will be resurrected. And not only the believers in Christ will be resurrected for the sake of heaven, but also those who did not believe in Jesus will be resurrected for eternal suffering. What a tragedy. God gives us now time in these end times, in this time which is known as the kingdom of grace, in the time that we are the church militant to proclaim. So that not only is it that we are able to be encouraged by the promises of the resurrection from the dead, but we can also bear testimony to those who might not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And let me tell you, dear friends, that's extremely important today as it has ever been. Where people are becoming exhausted over all of concerns surrounding COVID-19. They call it COVID fatigue. It affects the emotion. It affects the countenance. And how wonderful it is that we can be encouraged with the truth that we are heaven bound. And how wonderful it is that we can take that message to others so that the fatigue will not destroy them. Even though it is that our Lord is in the heavenly realm, soon to be able to come and take us to be home with him. Even though he is there, he has not left us without resource. We have his holy word and we have his sacraments. It is through his holy word and sacraments that he continues to bring people to faith as he did for you and for me. He continues to nurture people's faith as he has done for you and for me. He continues to lift up the promise of life everlasting through those means of grace. We hear the words, your sins are forgiven you and Luther says, when it is that we hear those words, for where there is the forgiveness of sins, there is then life and salvation. And as you know, I like to turn that around. Knowing that I'm heaven bound helps me to contextualize my life here on earth. What a wonderful blessing. See, dear friends, that's why we need to be reaching out, serving Jesus, and celebrating his love. So that people might be renewed in hope and find strength in that way. So throughout this period of time, we have been anticipating the end of all things. We live with confidence. We profess by word and deed. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may that peace of God that surpasses all understanding May it guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to rise at this time, if you would please, and we'll make profession of our faith as we sing this version of the Apostles' Creed.
to the familiar melody of what a friend we have in Jesus. congregation may be seated for just a few moments as the offering is presented. As I've stated in previous Sundays, your respite will be much longer in heaven. And so it is, I'd invite you to rise for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you promised to seek the lost. We pray for all those who have wandered away from your church. We pray that you would strengthen us to reach out to them, to receive them with open arms and open hearts when they return home. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, you promised to strengthen the weak. Send your strength and courage to all those who need it. For the aging, the lonely, the tired, the vulnerable. Protect and defend them from all the wolves of this world. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, you promised to feed your sheep with good pasture. Raise up faithful servants and shepherds to share in the nourishment of your word and sacraments with all your sheep. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, you promised to rescue your flock from the enemies. Guard and keep us from the enemies of sin, death, and Satan. Lead us away from temptation and always closer to the arms of our good shepherd. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, you promised to bind up the injured. Bring your healing to all those who suffer now through injury, illness, and oppression. 
Heal them according to your good and gracious will. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, by your word you have told us that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. As we await the return of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead, we still grieve and mourn when the enemy of death strikes our friends and family. Be near all those who are mourning the death of loved ones. Comfort them with the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, you have invited us to lift up intercessions when it is that we come together. And so we lift up these prayers on behalf of our family here, as well as those, dear Lord, connected to our family. We offer you a word of thanksgiving for the birth of a baby girl, her name, Laurel Annette. The, uh, the, the, the gift, dear Lord, born to uh, Nathan and Aaron, of whose grandparents, his grandparents are Rod and Ann. We give you thanks for these, one, this wonderful gift of life, and we pray that as mother and child is strengthened up, that you would safeguard little Laura until the day it is that she is added to your kingdom through the washing of holy baptism to be sustained lifelong in that baptismal grace. Lord, we have already prayed in general for those who are seeking your face for healing and strength. In particular, we name before you these your servants. Harriet, the friend of Sue, Jim, Jean, Doc, Diane, Donna, the sister-in-law to Sharon, Lori, Roger and Nancy, Robert, the father of Chuck, and Pauline, my godmother. Smile upon these, your children, dear Lord. Hear the prayers that we lift up. Hear the prayers from their heart. And let it be that by your grace, your will be done. Lord, we lift up to you in general all those who are dealing with cancer, all those, dear Lord, who are dealing with the effects of COVID-19. Let it be, dear Lord, that you bring encouragement to all of them and the promise of life everlasting, and that by your grace, dear Lord, you might also be able to bring them in strength and healing. We lift up to you, dear Lord, those who are hunting. We pray for a safe season. We pray for good stewardship that a right amount of harvest will be taken, dear Lord, from the fields. Safeguard and protect all those who are hunting. For those, dear Lord, who will be traveling during this holiday season, let it be that they might exercise wisdom given the various restrictions that are out there. Grant them safety on the highways and byways upon the flights, and return them home rested and ready. For family gatherings, dear Lord, even though that they might be limited, that indeed they can still, as family, be able to give thanksgiving to you, even in these tough times, dear Lord, for all things are a blessing that comes from you, even though at, uh, at times some things are harder to endure. We lift up to you, Julia, who will be anticipating surgery this coming week. We pray, dear Lord, that by your grace and mercy she would recline in your arms and know that you will keep her safe and that indeed you would restore her once again back to health. Let it be, dear Lord, that you be with families who are in the process of mourning, the family and friends of Jack and Ellen, the parents of John, the family and friends of Don Winter, and also, dear Lord, for Leonard and Janice, as they, dear Lord, are remembering this week their daughter Lori, who had come home to be, you, uh, to be with you eight years ago. Let it be, dear Lord, that you bring a uh, blessing uh, of comfort. We give you thanks for all the mercies you had shown to Jack and Ellen, to Don and to Lori while in this life. And pray, dear Lord, that by your grace and your mercy, that comfort can come to their families. Incline our hearts unto wisdom that we are ready and prepared for when you would call us to be home with you. It is into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Trust in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son to be our good shepherd. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, liberate, and defend us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood 
as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, and when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is a new testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Now as often as we drink this, or eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remembering your mercy and rejoicing in your grace and favor, we pray, you Heavenly Father, to sustain your people in hope until that day when your kingdom will no more be divided by time and space. When at last the eternal day dawns, Grant that, reunited with the saints who went before us with the sign of faith, we dwell in your eternal presence forevermore. According to our Savior's word and example, hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Congregation may be seated.
and invite the congregation to rise for the blessing. And now may this Christ's true body and his true blood may strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven you. You be at peace. Amen. We bow our heads in prayer. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you gather us together once more to share with the joys of this sacrament. And we pray that you would strengthen us by your Son's body and blood, that as heirs of your kingdom we may ever serve you and our neighbors. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of Almighty God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you in favor and give you his peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated. There's a few announcements that I need to be able to share with you. So let's just do that. Um, just a, a reminder to the congregants, and that is that uh, Pastor Fitch is on vacation for this coming uh, for this week. He will be back officially in the office as of November 30th. On account of the fact that he is on vacation, uh, there was no youth confirmation class today for the fifth and sixth graders, uh, and that indeed on Wednesday evening there is no youth confirmation for the seventh and eighth graders. So do keep those things in mind. This coming Wednesday evening, we have a worship service at seven o'clock, a time to celebrate a national day of Thanksgiving. It is uh, suggested, uh, not suggested, that I'd highly recommended that mass be worn for that service out of love toward God and love for neighbor. And so uh, invite you to be able to come and join uh, in that uh, wonderful celebration. In reference to the bazaar, uh, there is a, um, uh, a lot of information in the worship folder. Uh, a bug was put in my ear here to uh, let those of you who um, uh, are at least listening at home, uh, there's an insert that is coming to you in your email uh, that uh, seemed to be missing uh, on Friday when uh, uh, information was sent out. So um, please do watch for that. It should come to you through your email as you receive your usual weekly bulletin news. Voters Assembly is coming up on Monday, November the 30th. That'll be at 6.30 p.m. My major parts of business, uh, other than uh, just the reports to be offered up, is that there'll be the annual elections. There will be also the uh, uh, budget uh, for the year 2021 to be considered. And there will be a special presentation that will be offered up in that voters' assembly by our Board of Stewardship and by our Board of Trustees due to two major capital uh, issues that are now facing us here in the congregation insofar as the fact and not just the roofs, but even now our boiler. So I invite you to be able to come and be able to listen to that uh, as far as that goes. If you are willing to run for a, an office, please also contact uh, Lauren uh, uh, so that he uh, would want to, so that he can know of your desires or otherwise contact one of the pastors or one of the members of council and that'll be fine. Church office will be closed this coming Thursday and Friday due to the holiday. And so I uh, just wanted to be able to share that with you as well. I had a wonderful vacation last weekend. It was nice to be able to be sitting in church and have my son feeding me as he was preaching. And uh, <coughs> we now know as of Tuesday that uh, grandchild number six is going to be a boy. And so... Uh, we're really rejoicing over that uh, as far as that goes. Ryan had guaranteed that it was going to be a girl, and uh, he, his guarantee uh, didn't work. Uh, however, my daughter-in-law did express to me that he then looked to her and said, well, maybe the next one. My son lives as dangerously as I do. So nevertheless, be that as may, we're looking forward to the birth of the little one in April. All right, dear friends, we're ready to bring conclusion to our service, and we're going to do just that. Our closing hymn, we got plenty of time to be able to sing that, and so we're going to sing the whole of the hymn, 
And we'll go ahead also then and uh, rise for the sixth verse. Peace serve the Lord.